That Rihanna concert was amazing. Now we can focus on a real sport again. Run It Back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up, run it back. Yeah. Run it up. Welcome run it to yeah, Run yeah. It Back. It's a Monday morning. I don't know why Eddie's already laughing because you know all the questions are going to go to you first this morning because this is our first time seeing each other since the trade deadline uh, came and went, which seems like seven weeks ago. But I'd like to introduce everyone, as always, Stadium Insider Sham Sharania, who just went to his very first Super Bowl. How was it? It was an amazing time. They they played the same songs, the same music over and over, so my head is just filled. <laughs> I'm hoping Chandler will sing before the end of this show ends. That's all. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Chandler. Um, did you rip the price tag off of that jersey before you put it on this morning? How's it going, buddy? Uh, listen, I'm a I'm not a Chiefs fan. I'm a Travis Kelsey fan, and they got it done last night. In spite of all the people saying they never would, except for I never heard anyone say that. That's so weird. And on the end, Eddie Gonzalez, who has been fielding so many Twitter questions over the weekend. I've enjoyed watching your feed grow and grow and grow. We will get to you, I don't know, right away, because guess what? Trade deadline, Kevin Durant. One o'clock in the morning and the news breaks. Are you kidding me? It's making his first appearance right there. Oh, it looks so weird as a member of the Phoenix Suns. We're gonna run the floor right now, Shams. How, and most importantly, why did this deal get done? I think we have to go all the way back to last summer when Kevin Durant asked out, we all know about the trade request right on the eve of free agency. And then he goes to Joe Sy and asks for Sean Marks and Steve Nash uh, to basically get fired or he needs to get traded. The organization decides to not do any of that. They get him to come back. They recommit to him. And I think during that process, they made it clear to him, if this season goes sideways, they will work with him and send him to his, his destination of choice. And they would work with him on a trade. So Kevin Durant came into this season fully locked in. And then we all know what happened. It came out of nowhere. Kyrie Irving requests a trade. And when that happened, it was not only a domino effect for Kevin Durant in the Nets, it was really a domino effect for the entire league. And so once that happened, Kevin Durant, the Nets, they worked on his trade and the Suns were his preferred destination. And the sides were in negotiations for several days, even leading up to the trade. There was a high price threshold here. Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, four first round picks, a pick swap. It's a massive haul that now puts Kevin Durant on the same team as Chris Paul, Devin Booker, DeAndre Ayton. And so uh, we, we see a Nets team that's kind of starting to retool now. It was time for them to move on from this Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving regime. You can kind of see the cloud leave that organization. They feel like they're in a better place now. Uh, but this puts Kevin Durant in a place where he has a chance to really compete for a championship. He has a chance to compete against players he wants to play with uh, and, and players that are committed uh, to winning games. I mean, talk about a first day of work for Matt Ishbia. That is a, that is a way to make a splash. Eddie, you know KD better than most. How excited is he now? New place, new uniform, new teammates. I mean, he's obviously excited, but I think it's bittersweet as well. You know, what most people may not believe, but Kevin was really locked into Brooklyn, really committed to what the Nets were going forward and, and was looking forward to the next three years, four years of his career here and had settled into – a nice uh, spot in Brooklyn, was enjoying his routine. He was close to the arenas, close to the practice facility, and had really come to love that routine he had, he he was having. But look, I, I think a lot of people think him and Kyrie were quote unquote attached to the hip or a package deal. It wasn't the fact that Kyrie was traded. I think it was more so about the fact that they didn't get another star back. There was no co-star left for Kevin afterwards. And you know, I think for Brooklyn, a lot of people call it the win now trade, and it was in a sense, but there was also a bit of in the summer we'll improve even more. In the summer we can even do this. In the summer we'll have this many draft picks, and we just acquired one, and we have the Philly pick, and we can cobble together five draft picks and get a star in the summer. And then that's how stars are typically acquired in the league right now. You get a Donovan Mitchell in August and September. You, you don't typically get them in February. But to intimate that to a 34-year-old, 15-year veteran who's looking to win a title now, that's a bit of a stress to ask for, and I think that's what it ultimately came down to. Not the fact that Kyrie was gone. It's the fact that they maybe have taken a step back from being a true contender and didn't get a co-star back in their trade. So, yeah, Kevin is obviously excited, but he was enjoying Brooklyn and, and had come to really commit to what Brooklyn was providing him. And so, you know, we'll see when he gets back on the court, um, but – you know, everything I've heard, it, it sounds great. And I think we'll hear from him 
Thursday this week? And he'll be able to put it in his own words. Uh, it, it is. I, I mean, I want to kind of get back to the idea that they didn't get a, a star back because I do have questions about that. But Chandler, do, are, are the Suns now the best in the West? Is it just that simple? No, it's not that simple. Listen, they're very top heavy and they got a very, very, very talented player, arguably the best player in the NBA. But there's a lot of good teams in the West. And and, and listen, this was a huge trade, but listen, this was going to happen for a long time now. And like you guys just talked about, um, with Kevin Durant on the Brooklyn Nets without a co-star, that's tough. And that's a tall test. Now at least he has the talent with Devin Booker. Now he's got DeAndre Ayton. Now he's got Chris Paul, even though he's older in age. And he's got real talent there. They're not very deep. They need to add a lot more there. But this puts them in a really good position now to win right now. And obviously, we just said he's 15th year. He's 34 years old. This is a tall task in a deep conference. When, when I, I like a lot of other moves, that like the Clippers, I think they made a lot of good moves. And, and they're right there. Denver's had a great season. Uh, so listen, this makes them very, very top-heavy and very talented. And a guy like Kevin Durant, I think you got to do it. They gave up a lot, though, and they gave up a lot of future picks. And you can just tell the way Kyrie and James Harden, and they're all talking. There's something going on in Brooklyn, whether that's with the ownership, mm -hmm. or that's with the front office. It's dysfunctional, and guys aren't happy. And, and this was a huge bust to have those three guys there and not pan out and, and to the things to fall apart how quickly they did. So I think there's something more there. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is great for the Phoenix Suns. They made a splash. They went and got a mega star and they're extremely talented now. I just, I, I got to see it for a couple weeks, couple months to, to kind of put them at the top right now. Um, Shams, that's the thing. I, I feel like as media, we've killed front offices for much less. But we're talking about a team that's had these huge superstars now, didn't keep any of them, and in a lot of people's opinions, didn't get anything back that would be even close to being considered comparable. Um, what is the deal? What is going on in Brooklyn that this is sort of where we are now with this team? Well, I think, you know, they went all in on a couple different trades. And unfortunately for the organization, Ky like Kyrie Irving, what happened last year with the vaccine mandate, that set the franchise back, basically leads to James Harden's departure. James Harden has been pretty vocal about the fact that Kyrie Irving's inability to be on the court, their inability, they played that three-headed uh, that three -headed monster duo, whatever you want to call it. Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, James Harden played 16 games together. They were 13 and three. So <laughs> it would have been great to see that that, that threesome in like a 80 game span at the very minimum. Oh, we yeah. didn't even see it for 20 games. And so it, I, I think it's a it's a run of misfortune, bad luck. What what could have been? I mean, when you think about the the biggest what ifs in league history, to me that 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 three team, uh, you know, that that three player duo to me takes the cake for sure in the whole organization in the whole league but i think when you look at the nets right now when you talk about getting another co-star they looked really hard at pascal siakam but to go get a pascal siakam to pair him with kevin durant it would have cost you nick claxton uh from what i'm told it would have costed you basically multiple multiple hmm. draft picks so you're mortgaging your future you're giving up a guy nick claxton who's clearly become a corner cornerstone piece for you right now and you, someone you'd want with kevin durant and pascal siakam so the Nets were really in a tough position because some of their assets, like Joe Curry, uh, Ben Simmons, did not hold that same value in the marketplace. So you're kind of having to mortgage some of your future and some of the pieces that really matter to go get that coast offer pass out Siakam. So you miss out on Siakam, trade Kevin Durant, and now you're you're basically retooling and rebuilding. Yeah, I think it's a great point from Shams, and it's it's really fascinating that Kevin seemingly didn't hold the feet to their fire with that one. Did did not mortgage the Nets' complete future to get him another star now, like we've seen other stars in the league do before. He could have told them, put every pick on the table, go get Pascal Siakam, go get whomever it is that's available at the moment, and seemingly did not. And seemingly him and the team both decided, let's go this way and make moves for the future without you, rather than make moves for the present with you. And that's a decision. That's a decision will take years and years and years to see if it was the right decision. Some of these picks are 2029. Hmm. 20, We're talking about six years from now. And then we still got to watch whoever that pick is develop into whatever that player is. What I think was truly the downfall, and I don't mean to place blame on any singular person's shoulders, but Kyrie Irving yeah, do it. and James Harden did themselves no favors on the way out, did the Nets no favors on the way out, and essentially tanked their value on the way out with their trade demands. James has talked a bunch about who's really the quitter. 
Kind of essentially saying, like, yeah, he understands why he's viewed as the quitter himself. And then Kyrie, same thing, comes and tells him on Friday, I want out, I'm gone, and he's gone by Sunday. He left them, no choice. There was no star for them to go grab. And the one that they did get, the one all-star that they did acquire in any of these three trades was Ben Simmons. And we've seen that Ben Simmons just has not materialized into being anything close to what he's going to be. He got on the podium the other day and said, I'm not going to be that guy for a while. Had either one of those trades warranted anything of true now value? That's not to say Michael Bridges, Cam Johnson, Dorian Finney-Smith, and, and, and everything else they got, there's not value. But value they can see right now on the court, all-star level value right now on the court, Kevin Durant's probably a net today, and he's getting ready to play tonight. But it never happened that way. And because of the trickling from Kyrie not getting the mandate and, and Kyrie not getting the vaccination and James Harden clearly miffed by him missing as many games – the team deciding to not let him play road games at that time, and on and on and on and on and on. Those guys got way less than they were worth on the open market, and now here the Nets are needing to get resources back later. And who was their best trade chip to do that? Kevin Durant. Now they're four draft picks <laughs> richer. They have Michael Bridges, who's probably the first team first team all defense guy. Oh, yeah. Cam Johnson, a guy who they can look to add on in the in the in the, uh, in the all season. And now they actually have resources, and it would be great to have on this team right now. A seven-foot, multi-time all-star <laughs> who can play on both sides of the court, maybe score 30 points a game. It just doesn't work no. like that in Brooklyn, though, I yeah. guess. And, and real last thing on this, I, I don't – they're in a weird situation because they're not fully tanking, in my opinion. Like, they have a solid <laughs> team. They just don't have that star player anymore. And without Kyrie, without Kevin Durant, they're not a contender. That's obvious. But you look at now the assets and the kind of the depth and the balanced team that they've formed here. They're in kind of that weird no man's land where they're not a contender, but they're not going to lose enough games to kind of be in the lottery. So they're in a weird situation now where at least they do have assets and they, they got better. They got younger. They got deeper. But they're not a contender. But they're, they're yeah, it's a, it's a weird spot right now for the Nets. But it, it, they're going to make the playoffs. They're, they're probably going to lose first yeah. round because they have enough. But it's interesting. They may not lose in the first round, Chandler. I don't know why all of a sudden <laughs> you root for the Chiefs and now you've decided you know everything about everything. That is not right. Eddie, how many times have you been asked if you're moving to Phoenix since uh, since the deadline? Over oh, under 100. A few hundred. A few hundred. <laughs> and I'm not as of right now. I'll be, I'll be okay, quicker to move to, sure. uh, to L.A. with Chandler. <laughs> yes, yeah, same days, same days. Uh, all right, like, look, that wasn't the only trade that, I mean, it wasn't even close to the only trade that happened. Shams, you were so busy. Everyone just was waiting on pins and needles for your next tweet uh, the whole time it's happening. You broke a bunch of them. Let's start right there. What is the most impactful trade that happened, in your opinion, after KD? I was texting with Chandler about this the other day, and great minds think alike. To me, the Clippers getting Eric Gordon and Bones Highland uh, was the most underrated, probably least talked about trade. Luke Kennard goes to Memphis. Houston ends up with a bunch of expiring contracts and a pick swap. But for, for the Clippers to get Eric Gordon, who I think Ty, Ty Lue will trust more, he's a veteran player. Has, you, can, you know he can score. You know he can shoot. He's played well in big moments. Um, he's a guy that I think will, will provide them with a lot of stability coming off the bench or starting. And then Bones Highland, he brings a level of electricity coming off the bench. He can score. He's something that they did not have with kind of those those veteran point guards and Reggie Jackson as well as John Wall. So to me, what the Clippers did kind of flying under the radar was 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 the most underrated move of the trade deadline. Such a Clipper uh, yeah. move, Chandler. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree. Listen, I love the Clippers. I think they've, they already had a very, very deep team. Now they added these two dudes that are bona fide scorers, can go get a bucket. I text Shams. I was confused. I, it's obviously something off the court or personality issues because Bones Highland is a, is young. He's talented. He can score the ball. He's great in that six-man role. Um, so to, for the Clippers to be able to acquire him and kind of relieve pressure off PG and Kawhi on that second string and Eric Gordon, and I think they got Plumlee too, to me, they made the biggest mm -hmm. splash. To me, they got the deepest team. And, and to me, I think they're, you know, they're a real contender now with the moves they've made. I, I do love that the Clippers did things and it was sort of quiet. And the Bones Highland thing, I think, had a lot of people wondering the same thing. Like, why? And what happened? Um, but the other tenant of that building, the Lakers, Chandler, in your opinion, did they improve their roster? 
Oh my gosh, mightily. And then it's why can't they have this team before the season started? Is what I want to know. Like now, well, they, they've they done themselves. Well. You know what I mean? Like now, they got a real team. They got deeper. They got younger. They have an actual team with playmakers and shooters. And if this was their team in the beginning of the story, with the way LeBron's played. This is a different story, and they got a real big who hasn't really blossomed in Orlando and Mo Bamba. Malik Beasley can shoot the ball at the best of them. Jared Vanderbilt, to me, is one of those guys that every team needs. He's tall, he's athletic, he's versatile. He can guard one through four. He can shoot the basketball. He's a huge asset. And then, and then they got D'Lo, who's a real point guard that they can build with, that can play make, that can go and get you 30 on any given night. So to me, the Lakers made a huge, huge move here. And obviously, I still don't think it's enough, and I don't think it's going to be able to put them, you know, advancing in the playoffs. I think maybe now they can probably squeak into that play-in if they kind of get moving here. But – this was huge for them. We all know the the kind of the issues with Russ and, and what was going on there and shipping Patrick Beverly out, which he just got waived. Maybe he'll come back. Who knows? But to me, they got a lot better. <laughs> we'll yeah, see. I'm with Chandler. This team is night and day right now. And I think the sneaky guy they picked up is Malik Beasley, absolute sniper who's going to thrive next to LeBron. The Lakers have been looking for this particular type of player essentially since LeBron came. And they finally found him in my eyes. He is going to get so many open shots playing on this roster. I think the problem looking forward is I'm not sure that this team could defend the four of us. So they're going to have to play some defense in this <laughs> conference as they work their way into the playoffs. And they've, they're in such a big hole right now. They're going to have to win something like 20 of 25 games to, to really get into mm -hmm. the playoffs. And they may be able to do that. I mean, if LeBron's foot is okay and they remain healthy and – they get a little bit of synergy in the next month and, and, and on and on. There's a lot of ifs, but the team absolutely got better. And I'm with Chandler. D'Lo is huge for them. You know, he can run the second unit. He can add a little more stability to that offense. And, you know, if reports are to be believed, then Russ was a vampire or whatever he got called. Uh, Come on you know, now. There's some addition by subtraction as well. I don't know. The Russ stuff seems oddly personal and, like, has a weird venom Thank to you. it. and. I wish him the best in Chicago or when, wherever he he lands. Maybe Shams knows, but uh, I wish him. The, I truly do wish him the best. I thought he played great this season, but he obviously was not a fit. And I keep going back to him going, "Yo, let's just have fun." And LeBron staring a hole through him in the locker room. So there was something to miss, but now they don't have him, and now they get to prove their point. You can't blame Russ for this season. I thought he played great for them off the bench. But I think, listen, when we were together last week, last Monday, we talked about them missing out on Kyrie Irving. And I think when you looked at when you look at now, there were two paths that this organization had. You go all in on, on one star or you, you kind of move your assets around and get a bunch of role players. And I think that's what they did. D'Angelo Russell, Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt, Mo Bamba, on and on, like Chandler said. I think this, this provides them more NBA caliber bodies more players that can play at a high level at, at different positions. Um, and so I, I definitely think they improved. And you have to give Rob Palenka and that Lakers front office a lot of credit, especially after last week. We, we As we spoke about, they didn't even call the Nets back. Now I think, uh, you know, they, they made all the calls they needed to make by the end of the week. Eddie, did you say they got to win 20 or 25 with a straight face? Did I? Is that what just happened or am I drunk? Is that... Yeah, I, I was I, I was inspired by your LeBron hat. I said, I think they can do it. I'm not wearing a LeBron hat. That's That would never touch my skin, ever. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all right, moving on. <laughs> there was a mention of Kyrie there because we finally got to see the project. Look, Mavs lost, okay, to the Kings. It was in overtime there. But we got to see Luka and Kyrie. Everybody's waiting on that. Uh, Luka afterwards said, it's only our first game together, but it's so fun to play with this guy. He's an amazing basketball player, and I think it's going to be really fun. First game, it was really fun. Mark that quote down for months from now. I just want to make sure we remember all those words. Um, it's only one game, Chandler. Have you seen enough? Is this thing going to work? Uh, listen, I think it's a work in process, but I do think these guys understand what has to be done. They're both smart enough players. They're both so advanced and so good offensively that this should be able to work. And I think when you look at where they are, they're right there in the thick of things in the West. They're in home court advantage. Uh, they got better. Uh, they definitely they got better. Kyrie Irving is a special talent. I went to the game against the Clippers, um, and it seems very positive. Everyone's excited. Uh, obviously, it's, it was the first <laughs> game, but... Uh, it, there's, there's a lot to go with this. And I think they know this is, this is kind of a, this is a trial period and everyone's kind of on their best behavior. Everybody's, 
trying to do the right thing here. Uh, but I think offensively, this is a perfect match. I think these guys know how to play with other stars. They know how to shoot the ball. They know how to play, make, they know how to space the floor. They've done a good job kind of adding shooting around these guys. But to me, the Mavs, the, Josh Green and Jaden Hardy, these are two guys that have gotten no love all year long. And when I went to that game and I watched them, these guys can really play. They play hard. They can score the ball. Uh, these are two guys that they're going to need to kind of have that impact off the bench moving forward. But there's holes defensively. There's holes with their size. I think they need to get Maxi Kleber back. He's going to be big for them. But I, I do think this will work. And I do think uh, there's going to be a lot of challenges throughout the rest of the season. But this was, to me, was a great move for Dallas. And again, it's the same thing with, with Phoenix. You, you, you want to go get a Kevin Durant, you're going to have to give up some stuff and it's going to be some sort of a risk. He's 34 years old, et cetera. Same thing for the Mavs. You had a chance to go get the best player available at the time. They did it. Yeah, look, they're they're going to be an absolute monster on offense, and you can just see the struggle with guarding that team and those two guys. What I wonder going forward is how they work them together. You know, when when Kyrie played with LeBron, he was a screener a lot for LeBron at the point of attack, and and like Chandler mentioned, he knows how to play with other stars. He's done this, and he's he's thrived in this role. And I wonder <laughs> when they get into that, when they get into pet, pet plays like that, and pet actions that will make them better. There was a lot of hot potato, a lot of your turn, my turn, and a, and a lot of, and they ultimately lost. So their, their defensive struggles will persist, and, and they do have to bend quite a bit to cover for Luka, who kind of just doesn't defend, and Kyrie, who has his struggles on that end as well. But uh, they're they're good enough. They're talented enough offensively, and and like like Chandler mentioned, the young the young boys they got waiting in the wings. Those are snipers out there who can make some stuff happen. So this is going to be a very interesting team watch going forward, and, and they're going to be a dangerous out in the playoffs. All right, Chandler, I have a question for you. You're a fan looking for a team right now. Are you picking the Mavs with Luca and Kyrie, or are you picking the Suns with KD? Oof. To me, I'm a home. <laughs> I'm a homer. I'm going with the Mavs. Uh, you, you think? Look, they have the same <laughs> record, the same record at home, the same record on the road. So we will see which trade kind of worked better from this moment forward. But to me, it's the, it's the depth of the Dallas Mavericks. Like the two kids I just mentioned, they have, uh, they still have guys like Christian Wood, Tim Hardaway Jr., Reggie Bullock. To me, they have more outside those two stars. And uh, that's huge to me. Obviously, they have their holes with depth. They have their holes with defensive, uh, defensively, size, et cetera. But when you look at this team, this is going to be an offensive juggernaut. And Kevin Durant is older in age. Chris Paul is older in age. DeAndre Ayton, let's not forget about all the issues he's been through in Phoenix. So, to me, I think the safer pick is Dallas. But, man, really? it's, it's hard to bet against Kevin Durant. I, that's that's crazy. Yeah, a 4-5 is, uh, man, let's start the play. Let's start him today. Might as well. We know where everybody's going to be. <laughs> not this year. Um, Shams, look, for those of us who are not capable of living in the now and we just want to look ahead, this time next year, Kyrie, will he be in that Mavs uniform? What are we thinking here? I think if, if everything goes well the rest of the season and then in the summertime, listen, uh, he's going to be a free agent. He's going to be going through another free agency process, take meetings. That's something he did not do last go around in, in 2019 when him and Kevin Durant went and, and went to the Brooklyn Nets. They didn't really meet with Sean Marks and Kenny Atkins and meet with other organizations before they made that decision. Uh, so now I think him having a, a actual free agency, uh, as long as everything goes well the remainder of the season, the Mavericks were one of his preferred spots. We saw at the end, uh, at the end of, of it, it was Lakers, Suns, Mavs. I don't think Kyrie Irving had a problem going to either of those teams. And I really think in Dallas, he has a great fit with Mark Cuban as the owner. Nico Harrison, who him and his family know. Jason Kidd vouched for him heavily throughout this season. This is something that's been in play for the Mavericks ever since really November. Ever since that tweet went out uh, with, with the anti-Semitic material movie um, and, and everything that happened that kind of casted Kyrie Irving's future uh, up in the air. And now he is a Dallas Maverick. And, and I think we'll see how the remainder of the season goes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, listen again. This is a this is a wait and see kind of thing, and hopefully this goes well for the for the Dallas Mavericks. But he, he has to be, or this is a very, very, very bad trade for the Mavs. And you would think there'd be some sort of deal here in place, but he's going to go through free agency. He said, "I'm not talking about free agency. I'm not talking about extending my contract, um, you know, till the summer." But after seeing Kyrie talking to him in LA. 
he seems happy and and he wanted to go to Dallas. Like like Sharps just said, he had a couple of teams, but he was open to going to Dallas. He has a great relationship with Mark. He's got a great relationship with J Kid and Nico. It seems like a good fit. Obviously, a lot of things can happen throughout the rest of this season. And but yeah, I'm with Shams. I think if, if everything goes well and, and, you know, they make a nice little run there, I can see him getting, a, you know, three to four year deal extension in, uh, and for a max uh, in Dallas. Eddie, so the options are he either stays in Dallas or he asks for another trade. How shocked no would you else, be? Listen, if it doesn't work in Dallas, no one else is paying him. So if, if, if I'm oh, Kyrie, please. for a long time, yes, somebody long, will pay him. They're not giving him multiple I, years. I think, Chandler, sports are stupid. That's why. That's why somebody will. It's it's like we fall for it every single time. So, or somebody falls for it, right? right? Like it's not us. What do you think, Eddie? Would you be shocked at all? I wouldn't be shocked <laughs> in either direction. I I, I wonder what works right. is like. Are they they win a playoff series? Does that works? If if he shoots bad in the you know the conference semis, is that? That <laughs> linger into his free agency if, if he's taking 10 meetings is Mark Cuban sitting there a little miffed about that like hey I really went out on a limb for you I, I wouldn't say anything is a sure bet with Kyrie I, I think the safest bet is a little bit you know a little bit of dysfunction and a, and a little bit of uncertainty when it comes to Kyrie I, I think he means well I think he's a great guy I think he's an incredible player and I think he wants to stay in Dallas as of right now but what is this, February, uh, March, April, May, June? Ju five months is a long time. Five months is a long time, is all I'll say. That's, a, that's <laughs> forever. That, that is a really yeah, so long time. It's like This is why you don't mention divorce and wedding vows. It would be a little awkward, but I feel like that's Kyrie Irving <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, look, the, the one thing I think the conversation's been a lot about, other than these gigantic trades, is the GP2, like, what? what's the deal, Shams? Like, this has gone all over the place, but now it looks like he will get to stay Golden State. What happened? So it was a four-team trade, Michelle, on deadline day. James Wiseman to Detroit, Sadiq Bay to Atlanta, Gary Payton the second to Golden State. But once once Gary Payton the uh, second got to Golden State, he took a physical on Friday. He failed the physical. He had a core muscle injury over the summer. He had surgery. And he played through that uh, over the course of that Trailblazers season this year. And he played through pain. He gutted through pain. Um, I'm told he was given Toradol by uh, the organization uh, in, in conjunction with himself. So he was he was getting a position to play through pain. Uh, took to, took that uh, you know pain killing uh, you know substance to to try to ensure that he can alleviate some of that pain and, and be on the court. But I'm told he's going to miss significant time for the remainder of this season. That's what the Warriors exam, that's what the Warriors doctors have, have basically told him. It could be two months, it could be three months, but the deal will go through because the Warriors, uh, they, they do eventually, you know, they, they, they do want him, but they also did not pass his yeah. physical. So this is kind of one of those things that we're taking him. We're kind of boycotting whether we're going to pass or fail his physical on the record, but I'm curious Chandler's perspective, Toradol, whether it's oral pills, whether it's injections, like how, how common is that in the NBA? And also, are you surprised that Portland or, or Gary Payton II would go through that in order to play? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's common, but it's it's more of like a playoff thing, kind of get me through a series. And guys do a bunch of injections. They do it reginikine. They can do kind of this sun vis type of stuff where it's like a gelatin kind of, you know, a lubricant on your joints. Uh, there's Toradol that's just basically a straight up numbing pain pill, like a pain pill that you can get injected into you. Guys go to Germany and do the reginikine thing where same thing. It's kind of like an advanced PRP that's not really certified here, but doesn't show up on a drug test. Uh, so there's a lot of different things you can take. Uh, to me, listen, Gary Payton's a good player. Is this a huge trade for the Warriors to kind of put them over the top? Not in my eyes. I think he had a great role on, uh, with them last year. I think he's, you know, a freak athletic. He can guard multiple positions. Uh, he kind of plays a dunker spot almost as if he's a five man very, very well. He knows the system. He knows the guys. He knows how to play with Steph Curry. So it is a good fit. But, I mean, is this like a breaking trade? Is this, I don't think this kind of moves the needle for them very much. And especially with all this medical stuff coming out. Uh, I went through the same thing in Portland where they, you know, they've had the Brandon Roy's, the Greg Oden. And when I was considering going to Portland and free agency, they took the physical very, very serious. So now it's interesting to see it kind of the other way going back to Golden State from Portland. But, uh, to me, listen, I, I hope he's healthy. I hope he can play. He, he, he's a very good player. But, doesn't move the needle much for me. 
No, but I did feel for him, and I and I feel like the fact that he was there is is maybe a little bit why they decided to keep him. If somebody else, maybe not. Uh, but we're gonna take a quick break. I hate this story, but we're gonna get the latest on it. Zion's newest setback, and could Danny Green be returning here to Cleveland? That's next. <laughs> Welcome back to Run It Back. Just because the trade deadline has come and gone does not mean that the scoops stop, Shams. Uh, um, you had one about Zion. What's the latest on the timetable there? So Zion Williamson re-aggravated his hamstring strain. He's been out since January 2nd. Uh, and David Griffin says that he's going to miss an additional few weeks after the All-Star break uh, because of that hamstring re-aggravation. I'm told it could be at least another month. And so we're, we're going to be without Zion Williamson, at least it seems like, through mid-March, and then you hope to get him back at some point uh, before uh, the playoffs and before the end of the regular season. But just a brutal blow. This is a guy that made the All-Star starting team. He was playing at such a high level for a couple months of the season and basically made the All-Star team and got all the accolades and all NBA consideration off of that start. So brutal loss for them. They have not played well lately. They're really back in position to kind of fighting for play in, uh, in, in a playoff spot, and they're going to do it for, for at least most likely another month or so without Zion Williamson. Huh. Man, Chandler, this sucks. I'll say it. It sucks. How how worried are you about this? Yeah, this is tough. And and this is kind of – this is a huge blow to him because everything I hear, the kid works hard. Uh, he's a great dude. Uh, but these were the concerns him coming out of Duke. And I think I said this on here before, but I have a medical guy in the NBA that I trust, you know, a lot, who I went through a lot of stuff with, who when we were watching Zion play at Duke, he was saying, this is physically impossible for this kid to sustain this. With that load and that athleticism and that impact with his size, the the body can't handle that. And so I'm not, I'm not shocked at all. Uh, I'm honestly more sad because when he does play, he he's, he's so great and he's, he's must see TV and you just see the dunk there at the end. The NBA needs more guys like Zion, but I'm concerned the guys played 29 games and they've been allowed 29 games and he's, he's been very, very good, but this isn't nothing to do with basketball. This is all just physical anatomy that I, I just think it's, it's impossible to sustain unless he really cuts weight or does something drastically different. But this is tough because he is so good when he's on the floor and he's just not on the floor enough. Yeah, it's, it, it's unfortunate. It sucks. Like Michelle said, we're talking about a guy who's played less than 40% of the games in his career. Guy who's never played, who's only played more than 30 games once, who just missed an entire season. And if, if we find out he he misses the rest of this season, nobody on this panel will mm. be shocked. And that's just the way he's been managed, and that's the way his body has been. It's unfortunate. And, and we're talking at least a month from now, and they, they bring him around slowly, like we said before. And we've yet to see him play playoff basketball. And at the end of the day, they need him badly right now. They're only a game over 500. They can just as easily slip into the play-in or out of the playoffs. And, and that pick swap won't matter as much with the Lakers. It was just two months ago where we were like, yo, they fleeced them in the Anthony Davis trade. They might get Victor Wembanyama off that trade. And now looking at it, it's like, you know, you, you really got to wonder about Zion's future and, and what his future is in this league as he continues to accrue these injuries and as they build up on his body. And if there's a true answer here, like, like Chandler was saying, we don't know if there's a fix for him in this body. He really shouldn't be able to do things he's doing. It's just frustrating because he looks amazing. He looks like one of the best players in the league when he is on the floor. Yeah, we're all missing out on this one right now. Um, look, guys are still moving around, getting released, waivers, all that good stuff. So Reggie Jackson, Shams, where's he headed? So Bones Highland out, and Reggie Jackson will be signing with the Denver Nuggets. This is a guy that has been a veteran throughout his career. He played at a high level. He had a great run with the Clippers a couple of years ago, making, making it to the Western Conference Finals. And so uh, I, I think Reggie Jackson will provide some stability there. They've been looking for that at the backup point guard position, guy that can score the ball, uh, play, play at a high level in meaningful playoff moments. Uh, that's something that they felt like Bones Highland could not. And now they basically both switched teams. That is, uh, all right, Eddie, what do you think this does for Denver? I mean, it plugs that hole right back up. And, you know, for what all the things, all the flaws Reggie has, he is battle-tested. And we all know Jokic makes it easier for everybody on that team. So he's going to get some great looks out there and he'll be able to play some backup point guard minutes and, and find a spot in that rotation. So they were able to move along just fine. And, you, you know, I think he's arguably a better player than Bones Highland right now. So it's an upgrade in that sense. 
Yeah, I agree. And Reggie Jackson, he kind of brings that vet experience. And the Nuggets are who they are. They got a cozy lead right now and as the number one seed. They have arguably the best player as well. And these role players are having really good years. Aaron Gordon, Michael Porter, Cobble Pope. These guys are playing very, very well at a high level. So you look at the standings there and, and, and they're in a really good place. They had a guy like Thomas Bryant even who kind of flew on the radar as well, who had some, a really good stint with the Lakers this year and just kind of grew frustrated with his role once AD came back. But the, the Nuggets are, are, I think, to me, I think they're a safe pick. I, I, I don't love them defensively, obviously, but uh, they're a really, really, really good balanced team. And, and offensively, man, they are they are impressive. Uh, Shams, last but certainly not least, big-time vet Danny Green. Going to have a new home. Three-time champ, a champ with your Spurs. Uh, he will be returning Ooh. to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, where he started his career. Uh, he's signing a one-year, $2 million contract. So he's getting a lot more than just his minimum. So for the, next, for, the la for the last three months of the season, he's going to make $2 million. He's going to go back to Cleveland. Uh, he's going to be able to provide them some veteran leadership, a guy that they can bring off the bench. But I think when you look at the, his suitors, the Lakers, the Suns, the Celtics, he was clearly looking at a, at a championship contending team. He played on one in Memphis. He leaves one in Houston. And now he's going to be in Cleveland for the remainder of the season. Yeah, he had a nice little list of, of teams that were interested, Chandler. Uh, he took the Cavs job. You surprised? And what does it do for the, the Cavaliers? I'm a little bit surprised, but no, the Cavaliers, this is exactly what they need. They need more vets. They need more guys like Kevin Love, like Lopez. And, and Danny Green's the perfect fit. He provides shooting off the bench. He's a great mentor for all these young guys. And and, and look, with everything that just happened with the Nets, I really, the, the Celtics, the Bucks, the Sixers are really the only three clear cut better teams in the Eastern Conference than the Cleveland Cavaliers. And we all know anything can happen in a playoff series. So <laughs> I think, I think they're a really good team. I think they're deep. I think they're young and athletic and explosive but i don't think they're a contender to win it all this year but again who knows and, and a move like this kind of gives them that confidence and that you know vet leadership in the locker room moving forward and going into the playoff with a guy with, with championship experience yo shams who who is danny green's agent because he's good he's smart he's watching <laughs> the league the cleveland has had this hole at the three all season long and it's a real opportunity for him to grasp at they need a shooter on the wing they need somebody who can help defensively it's really the perfect spot for him and i completely understand why he went there and uh winter's almost over so cleveland won't be as bad as it typically is and you know have a great rest of the season there uh smart job by that guy whoever his agent is i'm assuming he's great <laughs> Channel I'm loves Cleveland. I'm assuming. <laughs> By the way, I'm in Cleveland right now. It's <laughs> sunny and not that bad, which for me to say is a really big deal. I swore I'd never return. Uh, Shams, you are the real <laughs> MVP of the trade deadline. We salute you. Thank you for all your hard work. Safe travels back. Uh, and we will also take a quick break right now. But these guys aren't going anywhere. Next up, uh, Celtics Grizzlies on Sunday. Are Celtics still the favorite? We'll discuss when Run It Back returns. Run it up. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back. Oh god, that man has a family precious. <laughs> my dog Walker. Must my be my guy. Day. My, my Must be my day. another white boy. <laughs> another white boy getting postered. Oh my god, I got punched on. That hurts. That hurts. I've been watching uh, Precious hurt. for quite some time. He punted a uh, Kevin's dunk attempt in the Olympics, and you know, so he's got. I got a little vendetta, but this is this is worse. Can't punch up my guy Walker Kessler. This... <laughs> well, this is, I mean, look, this... I get. I don't know if you. Go ahead. I was saying this is a dream scenario too for a dunker to kind of drive middle and kind of he's he's kind of protected with the left side of his body, and this is the risk you take as a big guy when you try and block everything. Things like this are going to happen. Oh, funny you should say that. We're... Same game, different dude. <laughs> Chris Boucher on Kelly no. Olenek. <laughs> <laughs> that one might be words. Oh, oh my no, goodness. Might be. And oh man, we just watched goodness. Boucher. That is one tall, skinny dude. Did, he, did he travel, Chandler? Uh, one, two. One, yes, two. he most certainly did. One, two. <laughs> All right. One, this two. is tough because <laughs> Kelly already can't really oh. block shot or jump, and he caught him back. But he tries. He caught him back. Purple shoes. I feel like we've I, had I a few it. of these Kelly Olynyk moments, so 
if maybe maybe we leave him alone for a second. Poor guy. Uh, John <laughs> Collins with a. Hey, wait a minute. Ooh. No, I didn't approve this. No, sir. <laughs> Zach Collins. Yeah, this is oh. Collins on Collins crime. I thought he dumped do? it. I feel like all. I feel like this is all I ever see happen to Zach Collins. Like he elbows guys and then he gets shots blocked. Pardon? This is Pardon? tough. What's that? <laughs> Uh, first of all, that's not all that Zach Collins does. Thank you very much. <laughs> I am but surprised his elbow say... didn't magically hit John in the face here. <laughs> right. This is... You guys, Zach is just scrappy. Did he? Little... Leave him alone. Rim blocked him. That's all. <laughs> well, the good like news that. is you're going to get a lot more Zach Collins now that purtle has gone, so you're welcome. Uh, Lori Markinen <sighs> on Jericho Sims. Ah, uh, and that's impressive. Jericho Sims has bunnies. Right? Lori's poster tour continues. Nice. He's, he's got a nice collection this year. He's got a nice collection. Woo. Yeah, Jericho he really does. mistimed it. Also, Ooh, complete side tough. note, now I just saw John Collins. Isn't it funny that all the rumors of the main guys that were going to get traded, none yep. of them got traded? OG, Nothing. John Pascal, Collins. Not, I mean, Collins. Yeah, that, all these guys that we've been hearing about all season long, a lot of them didn't get moved. No, oh, the only Spence, one that moved my was Crowder. Uh, Dinwiddie on Joel. Oh, I like this one. This is big time. All Joe right. gave it a real attempt, too. That's like, that's, and it was in crunch time. That was tough. Mm. By the way, Tobias, Tobias, just just give him the middle. Just go ahead, bro. Like, what, is, what was that? <laughs> Yeah, that's how I play defense. Two hand, two handed <laughs> stuff too. Two hand that's stuff. That's how I if play. They, if they block you with two hands, you are falling on your back. So it is risky to go up. <laughs> Good I like punch. that. Just Good the, punch just the names Spence. alone. Um, look, there was basketball. It's weird that there was basketball yesterday. I didn't feel like it, but there was a pre-Super Bowl showdown between the Grizzlies and the Celtics. Boston shorthanded. Mm. They beat Memphis. Don't tell John Morant. He's still very confident. Uh, Sixteen points only, though. From Tatum, look, they've been the best team for most of this season, Chandler. So your confidence level, everything that happened through the trade deadline, where's your confidence level still on this Boston squad? Uh, I'm still super high on them. And a lot of teams did make moves, and, and the Celtics didn't really make moves, but they are who they are. They're so solid. They have their two-headed monster. They have vets. They have young guys. And the, the, most importantly, they play defense, and, and they play the right way. They play unselfish. Uh, they are a loaded team, and, and, and you see there – uh, outside of the Bucks, maybe the Sixers. I can't see anybody giving them a hard time. And last night, just are completely banged up. No Jalen Brown, no Brogdon, no Smart, and they still get it done at home against the Grizzlies. That's just who they are. It's next men up mentality. They're super deep. They're super balanced. And again, they really can lock in defensively and kind of bog the game down for you. So the Celtics are in a really good place. Um, hopefully, they can be 100% healthy moving towards the, the end of the season and the playoffs. And they are going to be a really Really, really tough beat and come the postseason. Yeah, look, that's a great win by them. It, you know, early yeah. morning game, Super Bowl Sunday. Nobody's pumped to play this game. That's a good team they're playing against. <laughs> yeah, they're missing a few guys. The Grizzlies missing a few guys too. Uh, Jason Tatum shot three of sixteen. It didn't matter. They had eight guys scoring double digits. They hit twenty-one threes. They shot more threes than twos. They've really embraced this style where they spread <laughs> out, they kick it around the horn, and they find these guys open shots. They're a tough team, and they're going to be even tougher in the playoffs when they shorten their rotation, when the guys are playing through their injuries, and, and they have their full bevy of players. And, you know, hopefully Jason Tatum's back on line with his shooting. He's had a rough week or so. Uh, but that's a tough, tough win for them. And they just continue to impress. For all the noise about all the other teams in the Eastern Conference, for as good as Philly has looked, for as strong as, as, as Milwaukee's coming along, for all the conversation about the Nets, and we were just talking about the Cavaliers, they're still the number one team in the conference. They still got the best record in the league. It's been an impressive season from the Celtics. And, uh, you know, if Jason Tatum can shake off these shooting woes, they'll look even better. They get Jalen Brown back soon. They get Marcus Smart back soon. They're going to be looking like the juggernaut they looked like in the early in the beginning of the season. Oh, I love that word, juggernaut. Um, look, Chandler, if you could <laughs> pick the best suited team out of the Western Conference to put together for this finals against Boston, if in fact that is what happens, who are you picking out of the West? To me, it's either Nuggets or Clippers. I, I think those are both the deepest mm. teams. I think the Clippers gives, a, you know, defensively, I think they match up really good with the Celtics. I think that would be the toughest 
matchup for Boston. You know, I think if when you look at the the Denver Nuggets defensively, their holes there, they won't really be able to guard Tatum. They won't really be able to guard Jalen Brown. Uh, and the Celtics are very good defensively. So I, to me, I think the best the best matchup would be Boston and then uh, L.A. Look, so I, this is uh, the Grizzlies on the other end with the loss. I just want to say to John Morant, just never, never let it down because he's still very confident in his team despite this loss. Uh, however, his coach maybe has a little bit of advice for them because they are, what, 11 and 17 on the road. They're still second in the Western Conference, so we're good there. But he did say that his guys need to be more confident together on the road for whatever that is, Chandler, a young team going out on the road, as confident as they seem to be, or at least through John Morant, how difficult is it for them to thrive when they're traveling? Yeah, it's difficult. And look, this is a young team. They are most likely going out on the road. They're enjoying themselves. They're having fun. And, and this is what you do at this point <laughs> in your career. Uh, but they are still a very good team. They're still very fun to watch. They still have a lot of different pieces, a lot of different ways to hurt you. But when you look at the Western Conference and you look at the moves that Dallas made, you look at the moves that Phoenix made, you look at the moves that the Clippers and Lakers made, a lot of teams kind of upgraded their roster. And the Memphis Grizzlies really didn't. And, and I don't think that changes much. We know that they like their team we know they they ooze with this arrogance and this confidence all season long and they've embraced the villain role and <laughs> and, and they're going to be in the playoffs and they're going to be a tough matchup and they're going to grit and grind you and then they're going to dance and they're going to talk trash and it's going to be an exciting series i just think a lot of other teams in the west made some really really big moves and the grizzlies didn't so we'll kind of see how it pans out for them for the, for the rest of the season yeah, look, they're the villain in the league right now. They, they're getting they're yeah. getting that treatment, and they haven't won a title. They, they've kind of done it to themselves. So they're getting everybody's best shot. They're getting every road crowd's best shot as well. And and it's it, it seemed to have them a little bit rattled. Like, I don't think they lack for confidence, but it, that does add up throughout the course of the season. And, uh, you know, they've kind of created for that for themselves, and I think they'll be able to work their way through it. We've seen them win road playoff games. This is still a great team. They're, they're nursing some injuries. They're waiting on Big Steve to come back. Um, hopefully we get the true Grizzlies come to playoffs and we get to really find out if they find out West as John Moran said. <laughs> he didn't even care about the trade deadline. He said they're still fine out West. So we'll see. Uh, coming up next, we try to make you some money. We are going to try our best on the fly parlay when we return. Run it up, run it back. Yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back. Run it up, run it back. Run it up. Well, when we last saw you, it was Wednesday of last week, and we left you with our hot, hot, hot three-leg parlay, trying to get you some money for the weekend. And the only one that came through for you was Eddie. <laughs> oh, God. Chandler, we're awful at this. Awful. I mean, this was the Mavs didn't have their team. Tyree doesn't really play <laughs> defense, and Paul George finishes 20, not 24. It's a bad beat, Michelle. What do you want from me? It's a bad beat. Well, and also, America, this is why you never bet on your own team or try and bet with your heart, because that's what yeah. I did. And I will not do it again, uh, but we start fresh. It's a Monday. We get another shot at this <laughs> until we don't. So, Eddie, what do you have for this evening? Uh, look, it's tough being the oh, resident no. gambling expert here, obviously. I'm going <laughs> the Nets plus three at the at the Knicks. They've won nine Ooh. straight against this team. I think it's going to continue. Right? I also want to say, can we get Suns versus Mavs like a prop for me and Chandler? Can, can we do that, Richard, Jason? Can we make that happen? Because I'm going, I'm definitely like going Suns the rest of the way. Uh, yeah. You know, put it on the show, make it a sponsor, do something cool with it. But yeah, Nets win their 10 <laughs> straight against the Knicks. <laughs> like that i told you they have the like same that. exact record record at home record so we could just start right now eddie i got the i match. like this i like it it's a side thing every time all right i like this i think it's a good idea chandler what this one is me? confusing oh. to me we got the number one team in the west who i'm looking at the injury report maybe guys game time decision on murray and 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 gordon but they're getting points at the heat and you look at the injury report on the heat Everybody is a game deer, a game time decision. So who knows? Maybe my guys are out. Maybe the Heat guys are in. But give me the best team <laughs> in the West Conference getting points anywhere, let alone a banged up Miami Heat. <laughs> yeah, and you locked it in at point and a half. I guess it's one now. Uh, I'm going to go with some Dallas action, but it's Luka Doncic under 32 and a half. Hmm. Uh, I have zero reasoning for that other than I just feel it. But if you can go by any of my feelings lately, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, you know, he's got he's going to split it now. He's got somebody to split it with. So, all right, Chandler, best party of the weekend was? 
Drake's. Oof, he it was uh, it was a real dude, and he performed for like a solid hour. Can't be a whole hour. Yeah, Bruce fun. Springs laughing at you right now. Ha, an hour. What is that? <laughs> it was a 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. hour. Too. <laughs> That's it for us. We'll be back tomorrow, 10 Eastern. This is Run It Back. See you then.